Welcome to the big show. We are going to make a transition uh, out of talking about experimentation and, and some of those famous experiments uh, to looking more at the development of psychological thought uh, over the early uh, days of psychology. We're going to see some famous names here, uh, guys that you need to be familiar with um, that have really influenced uh, the study of human behavior in the last 150 years. Uh, and we're going to start out with the psychoanalyst uh, when we look at this. The picture you're seeing here uh, is of the Wednesday Society. You've got two very famous psychologists uh, in this picture that we're going to be talking about. Uh, you'll also notice that most of them have some pretty awesome facial hair. Uh, and so I'm not sure if that was uh, a requirement uh, to be a psychologist back in the day. But uh, you know, if you're thinking about doing this for a career, maybe you want to work on uh, growing some facial hair unless you're a girl and I don't think you want to grow facial hair that probably is not going to be good for your career prospects so uh, let's take a look um, a lot of this uh, is going to happen uh, in and around the city of Vienna Austria uh, and so the group of guys that you saw there uh, refer to themselves first as the Wednesday Society but eventually uh, the uh, Vienna Psychoanalytic Society Yes, I am saying Vienna. That's why they pronounce it in Austria. I know we live very close here to Vienna. I may be talking to some um, students who are alums of Vienna Elementary School. But uh, in the rest of the world, not Scott County, it's Vienna. Uh, and these guys are going to seek to understand um, what they call the unconscious mind. Uh, and the unconscious mind isn't the way we think uh, of something as being unconscious, right? If we're unconscious, we're asleep uh, or we've been knocked out. Uh, the unconscious mind was an area of um, was an area of the mind where um, the people couldn't access. And usually, the reason they couldn't access it uh, was the stuff that was going on in there was so painful uh, or wild or kind of uncouth that. Uh, the conscious mind just couldn't deal with the thoughts and the impulses uh, and the things that were going on inside of um, inside of that that particular part of the brain. Uh, and we'll see a couple of different ways uh, that people interpreted uh, those results. The three guys we're going to talk about, a guy named Sigmund Freud, uh, probably the most famous name uh, in psychological history, uh, was named one of the uh, most influential thinkers of the 20th century, uh, and, and really no uh, no definition of or uh, no discussion of psychology is complete without talking about Sigmund Freud, uh, Alfred Adler, and Carl Jung, two guys that worked with Freud, but then are going to branch out on their own uh, to bring some uh, ideas in that probably you're going to be familiar with, or you'll at least. Uh, will we'll encounter it sometime during your life. So um, even though this work's going to happen, and, and really you're talking the, um, the 20s and the, and the 30s, uh, a lot of the, the work here is going to happen. Um, Freud himself uh, died in London um, at, the, you know, at, at the end of his life. He, he lived there because he was fleeing uh, the Nazis uh, and, and kind of uh, um, them, them chasing after him. Nazis did not like um, psychology a whole lot. They called it a Jewish science. Uh, burned psychology books uh, that uh, that these guys had written, and, and ultimately, you know, Ford felt threatened enough that that he uh, he ended up moving. Um, but really, what these guys focus on, and it's it's something that's still around today, uh, is the idea of talking with patients. Right? Uh, Freud called it the talking cure. Um, the the term that enters in. Uh, to the language after that is psychoanalysis. Um, the guys, you know, we're going to sit down and we're going to dig into kind of the roots of some of these feelings and behaviors that you have uh, to seek to help you to better understand them. Uh, the picture that you see on the screen is actually uh, Freud's famous couch. Uh, he was um, a fan of using hypnosis to help access uh, the unconscious parts of the brain. He fi figured out that it was easier um, to get people hypnotized if they were laying down. Uh, and so uh, sometimes we see that still today in movies and things like that. You'll see people going to therapists and, and the therapist has got a comfortable place for them to sit or lay down just to kind of put them at ease. 
as they're having some of these uh, difficult uh, conversations. But that is uh, the original uh, wild-looking Freudian couch uh, that, uh, that you see in front of you. I'm going to shine the spotlight first on Sigmund Freud. Uh, this is him a little later in life. You'll see some, some different pictures uh, that come from there. Like I said, his main uh, contribution uh, to, to psychology is going to be this idea of the talking uh, cure. He doesn't actually uh, come up with it on his own. He's, he's convinced of its worth um, after he reads about a case of a psychologist there in Vienna who was working with a patient named Anna O. Uh, and Anna O is a famous patient in psychological history. She um, has an experience where um, she wakes up and can't move anything from the neck down. Um, and as the therapist works with her, um, starts kind of chugging through some of these issues, um, it becomes clear that she is um, feeling guilty. Um, because uh, she was taking care of an invalid father. Uh, he was going to pass away, but wasn't doing it very quickly. And so she spent a lot of her life taking care of him, but looking out the window, thinking about all the things that she could be doing. She found herself wishing, hey, if dad's going to die, we she get on with it. Of course, that's a thought that uh, would be uncomfortable for any uh, loving child. And so uh, she has a dream. Uh, and in this dream, a giant black snake slithers into the room she's sitting in a chair by her father's bedside slithers around her entire body and squeezes and when she uh, the squeeze wakes her up uh, but she can't move anything uh, and so her therapist will work with her as they talk through some of these issues she eventually uh, regains uh, the use of her limbs Freud's fascinated by this idea that psychological problems can cause physical symptoms uh, and so he starts to treat patients for what he calls hysteria um, now, don't go tell people they're hysterical today. That's not going to go very well, but that's one of the things that's there. Uh, biggest thing about Freud, kind of the most controversial, is he was talking about sex uh, and sexual energy at a time where nobody else was. Uh, Victorian society was not uh, open to having those discussions. Really, if you look at his writings, though, he's not concentrating as much on sex as any kind of pleasurable... Um, activity uh, that a person can do. Um, he talks about sexual energy and he uses the term libido. Uh, now libido today we think means sex drive. You'll hear it sometimes in those awkward commercials for uh, you know like uh, Viagra and Cialis things like that. But uh, for Freud this was just a, a concentration of uh, energy uh, in different places. When we do developmental theories we'll take a look at uh, Freud's theory of, of psychosexual development and talk about that a little more. Uh, but that's really what he means. It's not necessarily the desire to have sex. Uh, that wasn't Freud's definition of it. Uh, but it, were, it was these unconscious urges, these things that uh, we want to do. Um, and, and some of them definitely revolve around the idea of sex, but not all of them. Uh, but he gets a reputation uh, as being somebody who is always talking about kind of this taboo subject. He actually gets an offer later on in his career uh, to move to Hollywood to consult on movie scripts, uh, but, uh, but he doesn't do it. Uh, probably his uh, most out there idea is what is called the Oedipus Complex. And Oedipus is a play, uh, or it, it was a play by a Greek guy named Sophocles. I had to read it when I was in college. Uh, and the story of Oedipus, uh, basically his dad uh, is... Um, the the ruler of a kingdom uh, and uh, he's told a prophecy that, that basically he will uh, his son will kill him uh, someday now obviously he doesn't want that to happen uh, and so he has an infant son uh, who he decides he's he's going to have killed uh, actually tries to get his wife to do it she's not down with that and so she sends a huntsman out uh, basically to kill him guys looking and going do I want to be the kind of punk that actually kills an infant no, you know what I'll do? I'll just tie it up and leave it out here on the top of a mountain for some wild animal to come and get. Not real sure how that's better, but it made sense in this guy's mind. Uh, but little Oedipus is found uh, by a shepherd uh, who then will take him to, um, to another kingdom, and he is eventually adopted into the childless royal family of that kingdom. Uh, well, Oedipus later on in life is, is basically told uh, hey, you know, there's a prophecy about you. You're going to 
kill your father uh, and you're going to sleep with your mother uh, which you can imagine if you were told that you're going to do anything you can really to get rid of that uh, and so he decides he's going to move well he ends up moving back to uh, the kingdom where his his original parents are uh, and so when he uh, when he does that he encounters his father on the road uh, they have a scuffler in a chariot and Oedipus does end up killing his father uh, and so that that ends up part of the prophecy coming true uh, he then in the play is is charged with answering a riddle from the sphinx you know the mythological creature right the the big sphinx by the pyramids there uh, and the uh, sphinx ask him what let's see if I can remember the riddle what walks on four legs in the morning two in the afternoon and three in the evening uh, and Oedipus correctly answers man uh, you crawling around on all fours as a child uh, as an adult uh, you walk on two feet uh, and then in old age you need a cane to help get you around so you're walking on three legs uh, and so uh, the sphinx is really tore up uh, people in the town are so excited though they say hey we need a king you be the king and oh by the way uh, here's the queen right the king has died here's the queen um, and so he makes the queen his queen uh, and so does end up filling the, fulfilling the second part of that prophecy. Uh, when he figures it out, uh, his mom commits, commits suicide, uh, and he gouges his own eyes out, uh, and so very much the Greek tragedy. What's this got to do with Sigmund Freud, Mr. Bagwell? It's a cool story, but uh, basically Freud later on would latch on to these ideas, and he basically said uh, that young boys have an Oedipus complex. And the idea is that as a young child, your ideal version of a woman is your mother uh, and your ideal version of a man is your father. And so it's not psychological that you actually physically want to kill your father. It's that you need to take his place. Um, you need to um, stop seeing him as, as kind of the alpha male uh, and, and you take control of your own destiny. Uh, he also said that you know our first... Um, form of attraction is to our mother uh, and so we, we seek out people who have similar characteristics uh, to our mothers now take that for what you will uh, that may be a good thing uh, depending on your mom and dad that may be a bad thing but it's something psychologically to uh, to keep an eye out for uh, like I said we're going to talk later on about his theory of psychosocial develop psychosexual development uh, when we do developmental theories um, as far as personality theory goes uh, he puts forth this idea of the id the ego uh, and the superego and he used an iceberg to talk about this when he said we've got our conscious mind right this uh, part of our mind that uh, that we operate in and, and use every day but he said, there's a much bigger part kind of underneath the surface just like an iceberg uh, and this is the unconscious mind where all of these uh, urges uh, are going on and, and basically there's a battle between three forces uh, in that. Uh, you've got the id right there at the bottom. That is your inner wild child. I want to do what I want to do and I want to do it when I want to do it. Uh, and Freud basically said learning to control the id is what influences your, your personality or behavior. Right? Uh, the part of your brain that does that is the ego. right? Kind of holding that in check uh, and saying okay we don't just do what our urges tell us. We need to have limits. Uh, and then kind of the referee between the two uh, is the superego. The superego is telling you what is morally right. right? So it's kind of the angel on one shoulder, uh, the id is the devil on the other, uh, and poor little ego is trying to figure, figure out how to keep things balanced. Uh, but his picture of an iceberg uh, may show up on a test later. And by may show up on a test later, I mean it's on the test later. Uh, but that is uh, kind of his, uh, his behavioral therapy. So if you ever see a a uh, picture of an iceberg you're in another psych class, personality psych class, and you say, hey, prof, we study in, uh, we, we study in a little uh, Freud today. They're going to think you're a freaking genius, right, that you, uh, you already know those sorts of things. Um, Carl Jung uh, is the second guy uh, that we're going to see. Uh, he worked with Freud for a while. They eventually had a falling out, um, but, but they were best buddies uh, for six or seven years, uh, kind of bouncing these ideas uh, off of each other. Supposedly the first time that they met, uh, they talked for 13 hours straight. 
uh, and then kind of kept up a correspondence between the two and, and letting each other read their papers and books and things like that. Uh, eventually, um, Freud was kind of a control freak and, and wanted his ideas to be uh, be the main ones. And, and when Jung started to um, challenge some of those, the, the two had a falling out. Um, Carl Jung founds what's known as analytic psychology. Uh, and this was basically that, that our desire and kind of where they split wasn't, he looked at Freud and said, you're putting too much emphasis on libido and sex, right? We need to put, um, put more emphasis on the whole individual. Um, he is going to have a couple of ideas that stick around in psychology today, right? The idea of extroverts, right? People that uh, get a charge from being around other people and introverts, uh, people that like to be by themselves a little bit more, right? If you've ever taken a personality test, right, that's one of the big things that uh, that they will differentiate is are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? Uh, and probably some of you as you're listening to this think, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a really big extrovert or no, no, I'm, I'm an introvert. Uh, but those terms come from Carl Jung. We've got to thank him for those. Uh, he also develops an idea that he calls the collective unconscious. He agreed with Floyd, with Floyd, with Freud that... Uh, people had an unconscious mind, but he said that humanity as a whole shared a collective unconscious. Uh, basically, uh, ideas that are universal uh, to all mankind. He said these developed so long ago uh, that this kind of got hardwired uh, into the human brain. And so uh, he said part of that is the idea of archetypes, that we have certain common uh, characters in our stories, our myths, uh, things like that that are representations of certain characteristics. Uh, so if you looked at something like, um, you know, pop culture and uh, looked for like the idea of a wise old man, right? We think that uh, in a hero's journey, there's there's there will be a guide, right? There's a there's a Yoda, there is a Gandalf, there is a uh, Dumbledore uh, that's going to help. See how many people there are, right? And if you think about it, a lot of stories. Uh, you know, I've been watching Cobra Kai. There's a Mr. Miyagi, right, who is guiding the young hero on their journey. That's an example of an archetype. Got a great video posted for you uh, on the playlist that deals with archetypes, but uses um, Despicable Me uh, to talk about them. So you may want to check that one out. Um, the last one here that we're going to see is Alfred Adler. Uh, Alfred Adler uh, is the founder of what he calls individual psychology. Uh, which is basically looking and saying we need to know uh, the individual um, as more, most completely we can to help to treat them. Uh, probably if we go back to that lecture on paradigms, this is the pretty close to the biopsychosocial approach. He wouldn't have had the biology at his fingertips, but he was interested in the, the home environment, that kind of stuff of uh, mankind. Uh, he thought that people were driven by goals. It wasn't sexual energy. It was the desire to fulfill uh, your potential. Uh, and so um, one of the things that kind of is, is still hanging around from Alfred Adler is the idea of the inferiority complex. And you may have heard of that term before. Uh, basically the idea is there are certain things that we're not good at. Uh, and so the inferiority complex we will sometimes try to to do things to um, to overcompensate or to compensate for that. So if you're kind of a small um, kind of non-athletic person, that kind of deal. Maybe you really throw yourself into your studies uh, because that's a way that you can, co you know, compensate for your lack of size. And he said that's okay, and everybody does it, but there can be times where um, this interferes with your behavior, your psychological development, uh, and then that's when it becomes uh, something. Uh, that's bad. Either you kind of resign yourself and say, "Oh man, I just kind of suck. I'm never going to get this," or you overcompensate to the point where um, you you hinder your relationships uh, and your personal growth uh, in that way. Uh, and so, what the, the last video I've got for you on there on the playlist is a sample of a psychoanalytic session, uh, something uh, just to kind of give you an idea about what this might look like today. Uh, but like I said, these three guys, and there are others. Uh, who were involved. Freud's daughter, Anna, uh, was, was big into this. There are other names that you see in uh, psychoanalytic psychology. Uh, it's a pretty good foundation for us looking at 
some of these early theories of, of the unconscious, uh, some of these treatments like talking therapy, uh, which obviously is something that's around today. So uh, those are our psychoanalysts.